as this day has worn on, I've, uh, I've changed this presentation about 13 times. Uh, so um, let's see. What am I doing? Oh, that's the... Uh, well, I'll just give you this one. This was from a, um, a funding opportunity announcement from NIH. And if you don't have time to read it, what it basically says is we don't understand self-regulation. We just don't. Too many different paradigms, too many different methods. We need a new multidisciplinary approach. And by the way, self-regulation doesn't apply just to addiction. It applies to, if you will, any of the disorders of desire, any of the times when we want to do something that we really shouldn't do. And I've got a bunch of others like that. So here's a moral fable from real life that I use by way of introduction. You'll all recall Powell against Texas from the late 1960s when the Supreme Court rejected a claim of someone who was without question an addicted alcoholic uh, uh, accused of being drunk in public. The Supreme Court was asked to constitutionalize a lack of control defense, that not providing such a defense was somehow unconstitutional. Well, Leroy Powell's expert had said that once he, took, he had some volitional control, which is something we don't understand very well at all, he had some control over the first drink, but once he started to drink, he couldn't stop. So this is the day of trial. He had one drink at 8 o'clock. If you haven't got a chance to read the whole thing, basically he says, you know, why didn't you drink after taking that first drink? He says, well, I have to come to court today. So then on redirect, and then on redirect examination, the real reason was he wasn't given money to buy a second drink. So what's the moral of the story? How do we understand why Mr. Powell was able to control his drinking the day of his trial? Is his explanation on redirect, lack of sufficient funds, convincing? And I don't think it is. No one thinks, I hope, that poverty is a cure for alcoholism. OK, now, what's the problem? You all see it every day. 40% of federal prisoners are in for drug-related crimes. Not all addicts, by the way, of course. 30% of state prisoners. We know from big city epidemiological data that among arrested felons, between 55 and 90% have some substance, whether ethanol or a controlled substance, on board when they are arrested for felonies. Once again, they're not all addicts by any means. But in fact, there's substances involved, and many probably are certainly suffering from substance abuse or substance dependence, whether they're real addicts, as people talk about addiction, will come to. Now, you heard in Oliver's introduction earlier this morning the law of psychology and what is it. And I, as Oliver correctly said, am a strong proponent of the folk psychological model of the person and the folk psychological model of psychology as the driving model in law and criminal law in particular. Now, let me say what folk psychology is. It's not a pejorative. It's a technical term in philosophy of mind and action that explains behavior in part, and I want to stress in part, on the basis of mental states. It's not to suggest that biology doesn't play a role, your brain is dead, you're dead, you're not doing much of anything at all. So other forms of psychology play a role, and sociology plays a role, social factors play a role. But if you want to understand any bit of human behavior, it's crucial to ask about mental states. So if I were to ask any of you in this room today, and I, by the way, I've done this in rooms full of neuroscientists, why are you sitting in this room today? No one tells me a story about their brain or their nervous system. They tell you a story about their beliefs and their desires and their intentions. I desire to learn something about the relation of neuroscience to criminal law because I think it'll help me in my work. I believe this group of people will help me do that, and therefore I form the intention to be here. That is the model of explanation we all use every day to explain ourselves to ourselves, ourselves to others. It also explains why addicts use drugs. What do they desire? To avoid pain, to seek pleasure, some combination of the two. They believe by taking the drugs they will do so, and then they take the drugs. Same sort of explanation, which is not to deny one word that Wilson said. But the final pathway, ultimately, for behavior is going to be folk psychological. What's the concept of the person? A creature that can be guided by reason. A creature that can respond to incentives. Think about what law is. This is really potted, I know, and forgive me for breathtaking superficiality. But law is a system of rules and standards that's meant to guide behavior. What kinds of creatures can be guided by rules and standards. Creatures like us that can be guided by reason. And if you think about it for a second, all the criteria of criminal law, all of them, basic prima facie elements, 
all the elements of the affirmative defenses, they are all essentially folk psychological, acts and mental states, 100%. The criminal law is a 100% folk psychological enterprise. Does that mean it ought to be? No. But then what someone is going to have to come up and show us is why folk psychology, again, not a pejorative, why folk psychology is not an accurate account in part of human behavior and why we want to put something else in its place. In other words, not treat ourselves as acting intentional human beings. And that's what I don't like about the look under the hood analogy. Car engines don't have intentionality. They don't have a sense of past, present, and future. They don't have aspirations. Only human beings have those things. And looking under the hood has got to show us how the brain enables the mind. And here's a dirty little secret. We have no idea how the brain enables the mind. We know that it does, but we have no idea how yet. And it may be that we'll never get there. There are people who think it's beyond human capacity to learn. I don't. I'm agnostic. OK. Now, the importance of understanding any excusing condition is that it's, or mitigating is that it's got to be folk psychologically defined. And it must be demonstrated folk psychologically. The criteria for excuse and mitigation in law or for aggravation are not brain criteria. They're behavioral criteria, broadly speaking, acts and mental states. All of them, absolutely all of them. Simply because a particular action is said to be the sign or a symptom of a disease does not answer the question whether an actual excusing or mitigating condition is met. You have to show that independently, as Gideon Yaffe just told you. Otherwise, you're just question begging. All right? Now, some general stuff. We have two generic excusing conditions. And by and large, except maybe for things on the margin of knowledge versus recklessness, essentially we're going to excuse or mitigation, not denial of prima facie case with addiction. Well, there are two generics, lack of rational capacity and much more controversially, lack of control capacity because we don't understand control very well, which is why the American Psychiatric Association and the American Bar Association in 1984 recommended abolition of the control test of legal insanity. We don't know what it is operationally, and we can't, in fact, measure it. And nothing much, in my view, despite all the amazing things we've learned, has changed since. So those are the two generics, lack of uh, rational capacity, lack of control capacity. Free will is something we should just get out of our vocabularies, absolutely. Free will is not a doctrinal element in any criminal law. The notion that we have contra-causal freedom, we can act on cause by anything but ourselves, is preposterous. Of course we're caused creatures. We're part of the physical universe. That doesn't mean we're not responsible. Even if we don't have godlike free will, not even judges, law professors, and scientists, it doesn't mean we can't have the capacity to act for reasons and be guided rationally. So causation, biological causation, psychological causation, sociological causation is not per se an excusing or mitigating condition, even an abnormal biological, psychological, or sociological cause. And free will is not the issue. Now, think about neuroscience. It's absolutely mechanistic. Neurons are just mechanisms. What you've got to do when you're applying neuroscience to law is you've got to do the translation between this purely mechanistic science to the folk psychology of the law. So going right back to what David Fagman said earlier, it's the relevance question, the goodness of fit. And what I, when I do training sessions like this, what I always say to judges or other decision makers is whenever there's some proffered neuroscience evidence, here's the question you always want to ask. How precisely, how precisely does that bit of neuroscience evidence answer the question I want answered legally? How does it really show whether a person had a mens rea or which mens rea? Was in control, wasn't in control, et cetera, et cetera. That is always the question. Finally, here's another point that goes to addiction specifically. If we think of some reason why addicts maybe ought to be mitigated or excused. So for instance, Wilson Compton talked about properly their distorted judgment in the sense of they're not very good at anticipating long-term consequences and the like. And people who are addicts do show those sorts of things. So let's just call it distorted judgment and use that as simply a shorthand for all the other things that might be true of addicts. If we think it 
in fact, should excuse or mitigate addicts, it ought to excuse or mitigate anybody. Because if it's a genuine excusing or mitigating condition, it ought to apply generally. And you can't say, oh, well, the distorted judgment of an addict is a symptom. Therefore, the addict is not responsible for it. But the distorted judgment of a law professor or a judge, well, that's just character flaw. That's what needs to be shown independently. You can't just use symptom or sign language. Now, I made a distinction between, if you will, substance abuse and substance dependence on the one hand, which are actually the formal diagnostic uh, terms for what many addiction researchers use as the sort of basic notion. Persistent seeking and using of substances, and I put in, or other activities, how about gambling, things like that. Under circumstances suggesting that the use is compulsive, I'll get back to what compulsive is in a minute, often associated with subjective feelings of craving, I got to have it, I got to have it, and often at, obviously, a disastrous interpersonal, medical, economic, and legal costs to the users. Well, how do we know it's compulsive? How do we know it's a can't versus won't? Well, first, people tell us, I'm having real trouble stopping. And second of all, they go on doing it as... Wilson said they go on doing it despite the fact that they're having disastrous consequences, and they say, I don't want those consequences. I want to get my life cleaned up. Well, what are the objects of addiction for assessing agency and responsibility? Anatomical signs, we don't publish, punish for anatomical signs, right? That's status. That's Robinson against California. Same with physiological signs. Same with psychological signs. It's not a crime to crave. It's a crime to do it. It's not a crime for Mr. Off to desire to touch children. It's a crime to touch a child. And then there are the actions, seeking and using, right? So that is what we're concerned with. And there are, I just get my cards on the table. Of the three, Gideon has already talked about the personal moral weakness and the brain disease. I think the latter. Addiction is a habit that is potentiated by biological, psychological, and sociocultural variables. We're not sure in many cases whether they're pre-existing post-addiction or both, and it's very hard for many to break under most circumstances. Here's an inconvenient fact for the brain disease model, which often drives the, we've got to excuse, we've got to move to a public health approach. Most addicts quit. Now, they don't quit easily, and they typically don't quit real young, but they quit by the time they're in their 30s. There have been recent epidemiological studies, it's controversial to be sure, but it suggests that it is the most just sort of spontaneously remitting mental disorder there is. And these are people who are quitting without treatment. They just quit, and they finally stay clean. And I think the answer is like, much like Mr. Leroy Powell's. Finally in their life, especially as they get older and they've got better rational control, they have a good enough reason. Also, much of what we know, especially about the neuroscience of addiction, and this is worth thinking about, is not based on random samples of addicts. They're addicts who have come into treatment, and those are not random addicts. These are people typically who are comorbid, who have other disorders, and the like. So we're not sure what's doing the work with a lot of these studies. Now, I know I'm starting to run way behind time. I just went through you know, all the stuff about the phenomenology, but we've already used distorted judgment as our, uh, as our shorthand form of what it might be that would lead to an excusing or mitigating condition. Think about this, and uh, now I'm just going to use a really s smarmy little stupid example. I'm a compulsive hand washer. OCD is a terrible disease, by the way, especially at the extremes. So I'm now sitting with my loved one, and we're watching The Simpsons, what we like to do, and all of a sudden I say, oh, I have to go wash you know, busting up a good time. My loved one says, oh, all right. Now I'm having a discussion about the relationship. You know the one, the make it or break it. Oh, sorry, got to go wash. Now you're really peeved, holding constant the OCD drive. Third case, I've just swallowed a chicken bone and I'm, you know, suffocating to death. Sorry, got to go wash. I think we have very different sort of moral reactions holding constant the drive to those three cases. So you might think about, gee, seeking and using versus immoral and illegal acts performed to support the addiction, ranging anything from pickpocketing to murder, and then immoral and illegal acts related to the addictive lifestyle. Even if you wanted to go towards excuse, you might want to say, well, we need to have a sliding scale depending on what is going on. All right. I want to just 
finish with a couple of things. Uh, no more slides. Here's what I think is absolutely true. I think in the case of addiction, what's really going on and why we might want to mitigate them or excuse them is because when people get into a really strong desire state, and many of you have probably been there yourself for one reason or another, a really strong desire state, it's hard to think about anything else. Think about hunger or thirst. It just, it, it's like a buzzing in your ears. It's like a song you can't get out of your head. And it makes it very difficult for you to access the good reasons why you shouldn't do this. So I think it's actually a rationality problem. I don't think it's a self-control problem, except to the extent that self-control piggybacks on your inability to use good reasons to exert self-control, which is how most of us, when we do control ourselves, do it. We do it by using our reason. Now, even if, at the time of peak desire, you think the addict is somehow unable to control himself, assuming we could somehow measure that, or was suffering from irrationality, there is another problem that's familiar especially to the lawyers in the room, which is if it's your own damn fault for being in that state, think about alcohol and criminal responsibility, voluntary intoxication and criminal responsibility, it's your own damn fault for being in that state, we're not going to give you a leg up. Indeed, sometimes we aggravate for that reason. And to say, well, it's not the fault because the addict is sick, that once again begs the question. Because, after all, on many occasions, addicts are going to be quiescent. They're not going to be in the throes of deep desire. And then they know there are treatment programs out there. They know there are things they can do. They know there are places they can go. Now, their judgment is distorted. That's true. And that's a problem. But all I'm suggesting is do not think of the actions of addicts not as actions. Even if they're symptoms, they're actions. As actions, they can be morally evaluated. And the way you morally evaluate them is to apply to them the same criteria you apply to any human action, and you try to independently evaluate it. Was there a rationality problem? Was there a control problem? How significant was it? And were they responsible for being in that situation? in the first place. Thank you.